Hello, I'm John Yerberg, NASA Social Media Manager. Hi, John. Thank you for joining us today. Science fiction has inspired many of us in NASA to pursue careers in space exploration. And today, aboard the International Space Station, traveling 240 miles above the Earth at 17,500 miles per hour, what? we're helping to make science fiction a reality. Joining us today on the Hangout to discuss this topic are astronauts Mike Fink and Chell Lindgren at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston. Mike is a veteran of three space flights, including the commander of Expedition 18, and Chell is going to be making his first space flight in Expedition 44 in 2015. Also joining us from the film Star Trek Into Darkness is writer, producer Damon Lindoff, and stars from the film Chris Pine, Alice Eve, and John Cho. We're also fortunate to have with us today two museums. <laughs> we have uh, the Intrepid Sea, Air, and Space Museum in New York. The Intrepid is the home of Space Shuttle Enterprise. And also with us is the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. At the Smithsonian, they have a model of the Starship, uh, Starship Enterprise uh, from the original classic Star Trek series. We're now going to. I'm now going to toss it over to Damon Lindoff with uh, Star Trek Into Darkness. Damon, hi everybody. Thank you. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, it's really wonderful to be here. Uh, we've uh, uh, the movie is opening today. We've just sort of conducted a a buzz over the course of the entire world, uh, internationally, starting in Australia, uh, across Europe, finally culminating here in Los Angeles via New York. Now, finally, the final frontier, we get to actually leave the planet to, uh, to culminate our tour <laughs> for, the, uh, for the day that so the movie exciting. opens. It's, a, it's wildly exciting. We're all so happy to be here. Uh, with great regret, unfortunately, JJ could not be here today. Uh, he is still out there selling the movie. I think I saw him handing tickets out <laughs> on, on oh, Hollywood right. Boulevard. But he has recorded uh, a special a message and a question uh, for uh, Michael and Chell. Uh, that he desperately wanted answered. So I believe that we have his question uh, uh, queued up to ask J.J. Uh, Abrams. Hi, it's J.J. Uh, Abrams. I wish I could be there uh, with you in person, uh, but unfortunately I couldn't attend, so I'm, I'm doing this uh, very important question on video, which is the following. Uh, I talked to uh, an astronaut once who told me that on one of his missions he actually did see something that was very strange that he couldn't explain that actually made him believe in extraterrestrial life. And my question to you is, uh, have either of you ever seen anything that made you believe that or something that you couldn't explain, couldn't understand, that you didn't really necessarily report to the public but that you want to share with us now? Thanks. Uh, that was a great question from JJ. Uh, we get that question a lot. We all want to know, are we the only ones out there? And Star Trek helps us imagine what it could be like if there were other creatures out there, other people, other species. So uh, I spent a whole year up in space, 381 days, but it was only 240 miles up. So that's not very far in, in cosmic terms. So we think uh, as we go farther out in, into the universe, we might find something out there that we don't know about. I've never seen anything. Maybe Chell will on his mission, uh, but uh, I think that uh, as we go farther out, with the inspiration that we get from you guys making these, these great feats of imagination and excitement, the movies that you make, inspire us to be our best as human beings on planet Earth. What a, what a fantastic answer. Wow. Yeah. Mike, can you confirm that you have not, in fact, been taken over by uh, an alien <laughs> sentence? Just, it, was just, it felt a little too polished. <laughs> uh, I've, uh, I've done this before. And, you know, I'm an uh, I'm American human being who uh, enjoys being part of our space program. And, uh, and we all look up to you guys uh, to inspire us, honest and for true. Oh wow! Now we know that uh, there's something <laughs> seriously wrong. Now we know. Wrong. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, Chell um, wants free tickets. <laughs> <laughs> we, I, I, we can we can definitely arrange that. Uh, uh, the we're, we're definitely going to talk to you guys uh, uh, a little more. We have a, a bunch of questions. Um, we're really looking forward to asking. Obviously, we're going to be uh, talking to Chris uh, uh, up on the ISS in a moment. But we have two uh, questions from the Smithsonian I, I, National I, I Air think and Space we Museum. I, yeah, we have to go to the oh, space station now, I believe. Screw the Smithsonian. <laughs> space. We'll 
Come back to him. Yeah, let's go. So uh, are we ready to go, are we ready to go to uh, Space? Chris? Yeah. We're, uh, Waiting for Houston. Oh, that's very exciting. Station, awesome. this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? You got to be kidding me. Houston oh Station, we're ready for the event. <laughs> Google Plus moderator, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call Station for a voice check. Station, this is John Yimmer with the Google Plus Hangout. How do you hear me? Loud and clear. Great to be with you today. Great. Thanks, Chris. We have with us Damon Lindoff with uh, Star Trek Into Darkness. I'm going to toss it over to him. Hello, Chris. Uh, I'm Damon, uh, one of the writers. And uh, I'll just act like this is a perfectly normal thing to be happening. Uh, one of the writers and producers of Star Trek Into Dar Dar Darkness. We are literally tickled uh, uh, pink to uh, be talking to you right now. Um, and I'll let the, my, my friends here introduce themselves, but we've got some questions for you. We're very excited to be here. Hey there, Chris. I'm Chris. It's uh, an incredible honor. Yeah. I, can't even believe it's, I mean, it's, uh, it's whatever it is. It's 8.30 in the morning here, and we're talking to space. It's, a, it's a, such a trip. Thank you for join, joining us, and I hope you're doing well, and I can't wait to uh, talk to you. Hi, Chris. Um, yeah, I'm glad to be. You go ahead, Chris. You go ahead. No, I was just going to say I'm great to be. It's great to be with all of you guys. Uh, I, I watched the first 30 minutes uh, as I was exercising this morning, and I was riveted as you're racing through the woods and and jumping off cliffs. I won't spoil the rest of the movie for anybody that hasn't seen it, but uh, pretty cool scenes. How do you exercise in space just normally? Yeah, we have we have three devices: uh, um, a bicycle. Uh, and a uh, treadmill, and then this big gigantic uh, exercise machine called ARED, Advanced Resistive Exercise Device. Basically, it's like a uh, uh, multi-function weight machine that we can put uh, heavy loads on and do some squats and bench press and that sort of thing. And how long are you up there for, Chris? I'm up here for, for six months. That's, tip, that's uh, the duration that we do at the space station, and it's really from Soyuz. Uh, the Soyuz drives that. That's our vehicle to get up here, and uh, there's three, three seats in the Soyuz, and there's six people on the station, so, that, so you need two Soyuzes, and we rotate out every three months. So my buddies just left a couple days ago, and, uh, and my other buddies are about to launch here in a, couple, in a week or ten, two weeks. Hey, uh, Chris. Uh, sorry, Here we go. man. Please. Uh, this is John Cho. I play Sulu, and uh, just because I cannot believe this is real, would you mind taking your hands off the microphone, putting them behind your head, and saying, "Look, ma, no hands." <laughs> <laughs> well, Look, John, no hands. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Oh, Unbelievable. No, go back to Chris. Unbelievable. <laughs> Chris is hanging upside down in space. You can't drop the mic in space. <laughs> I think is what we just learned uh, here. Um, uh, Chris, one of the questions uh, that here. I think uh, 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 a lot of us Earthlings. Chris, <laughs> come on, man. Chris. Yeah, come on, seriously. How, uh, how can he just <clears throat> decide to stand again? Um, one of one of the questions. Oh, that's a good question, actually, yeah. Alice. Will you ask that again, please? How can you just decide to stand again? Well, uh, you mean stand here and, and orient myself this this way as opposed to any other crazy direction that I want to yeah. be? Well, it's, uh, I think, yeah. yeah, I think part of it is because we spend, it's a little bit of, of uh, muscle memory. We spend a uh -huh. lot of time in, in Houston and places on Earth uh, training in these very modules, and they're labeled with deck and overhead and port and starboard, which uh, is nautical for left and right. And... Uh, uh, so we tend to orient ourselves in that direction. But once you've up, been up here for a couple weeks, it really doesn't matter. And I'm at that point now. I can just go into any module in any orientation yeah. and, uh, and, and, and find stuff. Yeah. Now, it would be a little disorienting for you if I was constantly upside down or twirling around. So that's why I'm so positioning myself us. so it looks oh, normal for you as we talk. Oh. Interesting. So, um, so Chris, I think one of the uh, one of the things that we're fairly obsessed with down here on Earth is uh, is what you did uh, outside the ISS uh, this past week. Apparently, uh, well, it was big news down here. There was an ammonia leak. Can you just talk 
uh, uh, in layman's terms, because we're idiots, uh, uh, what what you did, what happened up there, and and how you uh, fixed it. Layman's terms is how I speak because I'm a fellow idiot. So that's <laughs> the kind of talk I need to to speak in, and. And uh, so it all happened very, fairly quickly, driven by the fact that uh, the Soyuz was undocking on Monday, and you need two people to go out and do a spacewalk. In a couple of days prior, I think it was Wednesday night, perhaps, um, or maybe even Thursday. I forget the days; it all blurs together. But Pavel Vinogradov, one of the Russians, his sleeping quarters looks out the window. His window looks right to this particular area and he happened to notice some unusual small 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 flecks coming out and he came down and told something to us and sure enough we got to some big lenses and looked and saw that there was some type of leak conferred with the ground they shot they showed a very slow trend in a drop of the pressure so they, we decided it was a leak we went to bed on thir thursday night uh tom and chris and myself thinking there's no way that we'd ever do an AVA because it takes a couple weeks to get that done, get all that preparation made. Uh, it's not like you can rescue Spock from a volcano and push a button. It doesn't happen up here where we can just go outside, unfortunately. It'd be kind of cool if it was. But uh, um, And then we put the spacesuits on, got them ready on Friday, put the spacesuits on on Saturday, went out, and Tom and I um, just removed a box, the failed pump package and put another one in. We got lucky in that the we think the leak was inside of this box that you can replace and not deep inside some uh, bed, embedded in some piping that we would have no access to. So that's the are, story. Are you, are you guys prepared for, are you trained to deal with all sorts of um, complications like when you're on the ground here training? Are you trained for that specifically or are you just trained to be uh, generally handy with space equipment? <laughs> space gear. Space gear. No, you you laugh you laugh space but gear. you laugh but that's a a very good trade. I think it's it's very helpful to be uh, ha a garage tinker or kind of a person if you're going to come up here on the space station because that's what we do all day long is turn bolts and assemble things and fix broken equipment. Um, it's hard to train specifically for that kind of stuff on the ground yeah. because. How do you know what's going to break? Um, which widget? You really don't. You just have to kind of have a generic uh, sense of um, of how to of how things should run and fix stuff that's broken. And then we have a really um, smart ground team that sends up procedures with real nice steps uh, in pictures and and just so that you and I can do procedures like that. Um, what we do train specifically for is emergencies, but the big ones are a fire, a depressurization if some meteorite came and smacked a hole and, and we started losing air pressure, or we have the, the ammonia that we just talked about. If it leaked inside into the cabin, then that's a big problem too. So those yeah. are kind of our three big emergencies that we train for over yeah. and over. You should also watch out for Benedict Cumberbatch. Uh, apparently he's very threatening from, 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 what, from what I understand. We uh, now now my my understanding is that you have uh, are, is a um, the population of the ISS right now is yourself and two others uh, and they are Russians and is that correct? That's right, uh, Pavel and Sasha. We flew up in the Soyuz together at the end of uh, of March there, and we'll go home together in in September. And and so we're a three-person crew. We stay together the whole six months, and then the other Soyuz just rotated out, as I mentioned, and one was coming up. I got a question for one of you guys, whoever wants to answer. Um, there's commercial companies coming online. Would you ever, if, if money was not an object, w would you ever buy a ticket and come up and visit? Yeah. Yes, hundred <laughs> percent. Done. I'm in. We'll see you on Friday. I would love to go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very, very good. I just emptied out two. Of the, we we have four sleeping quarters here in the U.S. side of the space station. There's two on the Russian side, and there's two vacancies right now. So whoever can rush to a rocket first, uh, you got a place Alex to sleep. <laughs> Probably. Oh wow. <laughs> It's very flattering. I'll be of use to life. <laughs> I have a question. May I? Please do. Uh, just, just this is dovetailing uh, on uh, Chris's question, but I have a five-year-old son, and if he tells me one day he wants to be an astronaut, uh, what classes should I tell him not to fall asleep during? Uh, 
I think the class that teaches you how to be a nice person, don't fall asleep in that one. We don't want people that are jerks to come up here in Space Station. All the rest of the stuff we can train for. Good call, Chris. Yeah, good call. You, good were, you were most certainly not asleep in that class, <laughs> quite clearly. One of the things that we uh, were very excited about when we were looking over your very impressive uh, uh, bio is that you uh, are a Navy SEAL. Um, and I think that a lot of people don't think of, uh, of astronauts as having that kind of background. Can you talk just a little bit about what, what your road up uh, to the ISS was? My road was through the water, I guess you'd say. Um, I went to the Naval Academy and I decided to go in the SEAL teams. Never really thought about uh, life in space. I was intrigued by uh, um, astronaut uh, the, uh, the profession of astronaut, but I never thought it was something I would apply for or even do. And then um, I was well in my career as a, in the Navy SEAL teams when I learned about another astronaut who was in the SEAL teams, uh, Bill Shepard. He happened to be the commander of the first crew to come onto the space station um, in uh, 2001. So um, uh, it was through him and talking with him that I realized, hey, if he did it, my background was kind of similar, maybe I should apply. And I applied one time and was not chosen and then uh, applied to the astronaut office in the, for the class of 2004 and was lucky enough to get picked. But um, we have all kind of different backgrounds as, as astronauts, you know, medical doctors, a veterinarian, uh, milita half is military, about half is civilian, and uh, of the military guys, uh, most are pilots, but there's a handful like me that did other things besides fly. So uh, anyone can apply. You just have to be a U.S. citizen to apply th for, for NASA. The other countries have their own application process. Can I ask a question, Chris? Um, I see that you have a wedding ring on, and obviously you must have internet up there, I guess, for us to be talking to you, something like that. Yeah. And uh, do you get to FaceTime with your wife? Yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, it's not actually FaceTime, but uh, on once a week, we arrange for a mission control sets up a family conference for us, um, and it's routed through mission control and then comes comes up and, and it's with video and, and just basically just like what we're doing right now, uh, except I'll see her on a computer screen and I'm just looking at a camera today. Uh, and we have email, of course, but the email only... It, only synchron synchronizes about four times a day, so uh, what we're used, to, we're all used to with email, where you hit send, and you and you look at your watch, and you're like, what the heck? It's two two minutes have passed. How come he hasn't answered me yet? That doesn't happen. <laughs> uh, it's it's sort of a time lag with the, with the email, but uh, very thankful to have it. And we don't have we have a. Uh, Internet, we do have the ability to go to the internet, but it's it's not uh, super fast, it's not super reliable. Um, so it's just really to get news and that sort of thing is what I use it for. Mostly, we use the onboard station uh, computers and assets. Is is there only one uh, internet console? So you're like, oh, the Russians are on the internet again, <laughs> playing chess for God's sake. When, when are you guys? Chess. That's what the Russians do, <laughs> right? No, God, sir, am I wrong? Time. No, no. That we that we each have a computer. We do have a computer. It's not like those those days where back you know back when I was in college there was a payphone you know and you're sitting there cussing out the person who's uh, talking to their girlfriend for two hours and hogging the whole payphone. It's not like that. I I am curious um, from from the pragmatic realities of what it is you do and you and you are up there. You are living it. This is your life. It's your it's your vocation. When you see science fiction movies, particularly ones that involve space travel like ours, is there a part of you that says like, oh, they they're just getting it so wrong? Like, it, what what is the thing that kind of annoys you the most uh, when when you when you see our uh, our our big time Hollywood blockbusters? Yeah, outfits. Other than the very, very tight, sexy outfits. <laughs> well, th um, no comment there. But the Not the that thing you that, don't look that sexy, always does Chris. grab my attention. Not that you don't look sexy, it, it uh, <laughs> the thing that does grab my attention is the uh, the everybody's always walking around and walking through, walking onto the bridge of the oh. of the ship or things like that, and uh, and it's probably hard hard to make that in a movie where we're uh, 
technically how would you make everybody float so uh, i understand but uh it'd be far more fun if you could because trust me it's a pretty cool thing to just be able to like do this anytime you want weird. Oh it's so I weird and every time he does it they kind of I, yeah, I feel like we just have to keep talking, but what we want to do is just watch, watch you, you. <laughs> like, yeah. just make you do things. Hey, Chris, like, I, I, can we just keep on asking? Yeah, yeah. Chris, <laughs> so what do you guys spend most of your days doing? What, do, you have, do you have certain mission parameters for this tour in space? Is it experiments, or is it, what, what is it exactly? Yeah, that's a good question. Really, um, I'm... Me, my time and all the crewmates' time is something that the ground manages and the program managers and the decision makers uh, really allocate our time as if it was a budget. And and how we br how that gets broken down, there's lots of that goes into that. But basically, the things that we do are we maintain the space station. We need the place to be functioning well so that it can support all the science that uh, goes on. Uh, but the main mission of the space station is is science. It's a national, uh, it's a research laboratory and uh, so that's our number one thing is is the ability to execute the, these experiments. Now I already described to you that we, astronauts come in all shapes and sizes and all of us are not um, really uh, research scientists ourselves. I am not. Uh, so so um, what we do is we serve as subjects or we implement the, the, the procedure, the, the experiment, that, the, and usually the principal investigator, the actual scientist, is on the other end of the radio and with a video, we have a video camera overlooking our shoulder and we'll be doing the things with that scientist to give him the best, uh, he or she, the best um, science that we can deliver. Hmm. I have a philosophical, sorry, I apologize, I have a slightly more philosophical question. You know, one of the things that I like about... Do you I, believe in free will? Yeah. <laughs> one of the things I like about Star Trek is that it has kind of an optimistic view of our species, that we're, you know, in the future, Starfleet is not a military organization, it's a scientific organization, and uh, I was wondering, being an astronaut, does it make you feel optimistic or pessimistic about the future of our species? Good question. For me, it's optimism. When, when, uh, when I look out the window and you're looking down at our beautiful planet, you see the beautiful blues of the ocean and the white clouds and white mountaintops and browns and greens of the, of the, of the land. And there's no borders down there. You can't see like a little yellow line painted on the, on the green part. Uh, it just looks like a big peaceful place. And you know that there's traffic jams in LA and you know that there's problems in Kabul and all these different places ar around the country, not to signal those places out, but I mean around the world, but you know what I mean. Um, and and when you see that all our planet from this perspective, it's just such a peaceful, tranquil-looking um, location, and it's our home, it's our spaceship as a, a whole, and it makes me reflect on how thankful I am to have it, and that uh, I hope that we take care of it. Amen. I, I I wish that every everybody could have that experience, but just hearing you talk about it having had it uh, I think that I speak for everyone watching uh, that that's incredibly meaningful I know we only have time for a couple more questions and I, j I did want to get a question from uh, from Google Plus and this is I apologize if I mispronounce your name Carlos Nazareno asks uh, and this is uh, very serious what happens when you sneeze while inside your spacesuit on a spacewalk oh Carlos Carlos, <laughs> that that is, no, Car Carlos. Carlos is obviously a practical guy because what the, your ability to see has to do with how clear that visor is, and we wa wipe it off and make sure it's nice and clean before we put it on. But once the hel that helmet goes on, any schmutz that gets on there is just an impediment to your ability to see clearly. So, um, in in reality, what you do is you kind of just tilt your nose down underneath the lid of underneath the neck ring and sneeze. Hmm. Uh, is schmutz a technical term? Is that a NASA term? Is that an acronym for something? <laughs> Houston, we have schmutz. Yeah. <laughs> it, you know, it 
It probably is an acronym if you look it up. I'm sure there's a million NASA acronyms. I don't know them all, but in my vernacular, it's a it's a t non technical term. I think that was the original line from Apollo 13. Houston, we have schmutz, <laughs> and then somebody was like, "It's just, <laughs> just the same, the same impact." Schmuckish schmutz. Um, do any of you guys have any other questions for Chris? Because I know we're about to lose him in a minute, and um, uh, I don't know when the next time we're going to get to have an experience like this is going is going to roll around. I feel like I'm intelligent questioned out. Anybody have any? Uh, well, I'll just say, Chris, can we space high five? Uh, well, let, let me, let me, let, let, space high five? Yeah! yeah. Let, me, wow. let me just, let me, yeah. let me just say this. It's, it's, uh, it's been, a, it's been a real treat, been fun to be talking with you guys today. Uh, best of luck with, the, I'm sure I've never been part of a, what's involved with the, the, the uh, opening of a movie of this size. Or any of any size, really, but what you guys must be going through these weeks, hectic schedule, hectic schedule, and all of that. So thanks for taking time out of your day to come aboard the space station. You're welcome here anytime. And like I said, we got two open beds. The first two here, get them. Uh, I think that I speak for JJ when I say you have an open invitation to be in yeah. Star Trek Three. Should yes. we be fortunate enough to make it? Uh, we would we would be honored to have you and and obviously uh, Mike and Shell, your colleagues, uh, make cameos. Uh, running uh, in whatever sort of silly scenarios we construct for the next <laughs> adventure. Maybe you could class up the joint a bit. Uh, we're really grateful for your time. Uh, we're really yeah, my pleasure. I, I, JJ, I particularly like that opening scene when they dove off the cliff and then submerged themselves and and to the to the ship. I loved that because that's what I did in my previous life. I drove underwater vehicles, so I I've, haven't jumped off a cliff that high, but I've definitely gone from the land into the water and gotten in a, a sub. So, great scene. Yeah, Chris actually did that. Well, that was, <laughs> that was not a stunt. There's just only one way to get a shot. Are like you that, gonna right? Are you gonna go back to after your astronautdom? Are you gonna go back to being a, a Navy SEAL? No. No, no, I don't think so. Uh, I'm 43, which in uh, in SEAL terms is old. <laughs> I don't think I'm old, but I am. So there's no room for me back there. <laughs> Uh, well, I, 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 uh, we, we disagree. There's, yeah, yeah. There's, there's more than enough room for you, as you so eloquently stated earlier. So again, thank you, Chris, for, um, for spending this time with us. Uh, do we have more time? Uh, I'm, I'm unclear that you were saying a minute. Oh, we have three minutes left. Oh, my oh, God. Okay. We'll That's very exciting. We so definitely Chris, I have a question. Do you have to stay fit in space, or is that just because you're a SEAL? Um, the short answer is no, it's not because I'm a SEAL, it's because uh, staying fit is is the best way to keep our bones healthy when we get back. What happens while you're up here uh, on a long, a long duration in space, your bones get uh, basically osteoporosis porosis, and they get used to not having a load on them and so they say, ah, I'm done, I don't need to work hard. And if you don't put stress on your bones and you come back to earth like a chicken noodle sandwich, so that's not a good thing. So that when you come back to Earth, do you have to spend a certain amount of time in like a pressure zone to kind of gradually build your body back up to gravity, or whatever? <laughs> no, uh, no, we, Captain. we Captain. Captain. Not even. We land, land, quest, we right? land and right yeah. right away we'll uh, uh, we'll start. Right away, we'll start flying back to Houston, and, and I'll, I'll be uh, at home about 20, 24 hours after after landing. And the process is slow. It takes on the order of the amount of time you were in space to totally 100% get back to your normal pre-launch self. So several months, it'll be a rehabilitation and uh, you know building up the the stamina that you used to have. Hmm. I have a silly question. Um, uh, when we finish a movie, we'll we have mixed emotions leaving the set and coming home and, and not seeing each other and also relief, you know, seeing your family again regularly and all that stuff. What's it like for you emotionally to come home after a stint like this? Yeah, I love that. My, my first, my first uh, mission was on the shuttle, which was only two weeks long. And I've done lots of two-week training trips, so that di time difference was not a big deal. Um, uh, in the military, I I have done. We, my family, and I have done uh, four six-month deployments prior to this. So it's not that we're experienced because nobody likes that separation. But there's 
on, on a really, to be answer your question c completely truthfully, you have to, as the person that's been away, your family kind of get keeps on going and they get in a routine without you, and you got to slowly inject yourself back into that equation, so you uh, in a nice way, so you don't get uh, rejected, so to speak. No, I'm I'm being a little joking, but uh, it's it's that it's a slow process to to uh, to get back, and but it's definitely one that we can't wait to do also. Well, Chris, uh, I have a six-year-old son, and when I leave for work, he, I, I say, I'm going, to, I'm going to work today. I'm going to make up stories. I'm going to make movies. And he's like, great, have a good day. This morning, I left and said, I'm going to talk to a real astronaut up in space. And he said, awesome. Oh. So thank you for uh, giving us this experience. Yeah. I think my son probably echoes the feelings of everybody watching this chat. Yeah, amazing. Let, let me share you one share one story about my my son was uh, uh, five when I came to NASA, and uh, the very first day I went to work. And what do you do the first time the first day of any job? You get your badge, you learn where to park, you go talk to the IT guy and get your computer password. That's what I, my day was like on day one. And I came home and my son met me at the door and said, "Did you go to the moon today, Dad?" <laughs> I said, "No, not quite yet, son. Ask me on Wednesday. Ask me on Wednesday." <laughs> that is awesome. Cool beans. Uh, are we are we uh, losing Chris or just? I just love the idea that there's somebody talking in my ear right now. It's so, John, do we? Station. This is Houston ACR. Thank you. That concludes our event. Bye, Chris. Bye, Chris. Bye, Thank you. And NASA social media followers. <laughs> as long as now. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. Awesome. Uh, awesome. awesome. Wow. So, he's got his socks. <coughs> his Incredible. face socks. What a Incredible. stud. Wow. wow. Uh, let's just absorb the awesomeness yeah. of for a second. Honestly. Uh, I, feel, I, I feel a little bad for you now, Mike and Chell, because you can't float around. Um, but uh, but uh, we do have, uh, I think now that we probably can go to the... Uh, uh, to the Smithsonian and get some questions from there. Are we are we good to go uh, at the Smithsonian yeah. now? All right. Hi. Hi. Hey, everybody. Hi. I'm Jessica. How are you? Awesome. How are you, Jessica? <laughs> I'm doing okay. Yeah. I like your little enterprise back there. <laughs> As you oh. know. Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. It's, got <laughs> it's on wheels. Pretty yeah. cool. Oh, there it is. Oh, All right. Um, I'm Jessica Tozer with Armed with Science, the Department of Defense Science blog, and I have a question for the astronauts. Um, I want to know what type of science fiction technology you want to see actualized, or have you seen actualized? Well, that's a, that's a neat question. I think uh, that's one of the real fun things about these movies and science fiction in general is just that um, opportunity to imagine what the future could be like and what technology is going to be like. And we're really kind of living in that uh, experience right now. I mean, we've had people living in space since 2001, a constant human presence since 2001. Um, and just uh, amazing talk technologies really spun, uh, spun off from the space program as a result. I'm a physician by training, so I'm really looking forward to a medical tricorder. It would be great to just kind of mm -hmm. wave a wand over somebody and, uh, and have the, the tricorder telling me what's going on. <laughs> I'd like to see a warp drive. Uh, yeah. The faster we can get away yeah. and, and travel the big uh, part of the universe, uh, the better, I think. And every time we make uh, good uh, uh, investments in space, we get uh, better technology and better life here on planet Earth. It's a win-win. I'll make a couple of calls for you. <laughs> Take care of it. <laughs> awesome. Um, do, we, do, do we have any other questions from the Smithsonian? Uh, feel yes. free. <laughs> Hi, um, my name's Annie, and uh, the movie was awesome, guys. I saw it last night. Thanks so much. Um, I have you. a question for the astronauts and the guys in Hollywood. If you had to choose, would you rather the International Space Station be helmed by Captain Kirk, Picard, Cisco, Janeway, or Archer, and why? So which of those captains has the qualities you need to actually be in space? Such a hard call. I think Houston's <laughs> got to handle that first. Okay, we'll go first. Uh, of course, you know, uh, Chris Pine does a great uh, commander, and I, I was commander, so I appreciate that. Um, I, uh, when I was uh, in, in space on one of my last missions, I got to talk to uh, Scott Bakula, and I thought Archer was a, a good uh, transitional from the time we left planet Earth to, you know, the first uh, warp drive. But each captain uh, helps inspire their crew and uh, each captain can uh, help bring out the best in their team. And I think you guys see that every day, whether you're at work, uh, 
you know, making a phenomenal movie or here at NASA or wherever you are, you know, your leadership, you know, if you have a good leader that can really uh, make the best of the team. And, and when you're going out into space, you need to have the best you can. We can't beat that answer. Yeah, it's, it sure is. We it's, can't beat that answer. And also it forces us to choose our favorite, which is, you can't do that. It's, like, it's like choosing your favorite kid. That's My Ed favorite Picard. is Kurt. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Love you. Love True. you. Original, Love original Kirk or Pine, or Pine Love Kirk? Love you. Pine yeah. Kirk. Pine Kirk. Pine Kirk. Oh, what is, what is uh, um, my, Michael and Shell, uh, it, it would seem just by dropping uh, Archer knowledge that you guys have, have some understanding of the, of the Trek universe. Where do you guys put yourself on the, on the Trek scale from sort of casual... A uh, fan to uh, living in basement, uh, uh, building, <laughs> building, re replicating bridge of enterprise. <laughs> Let, let's hear it. It's it's confession time, boys. <laughs> I'm uh, I definitely enjoy uh, speculative fiction. Um, I would put myself closer to the more casual side from the Star Trek uh, universe, but um, I I really really enjoyed uh, the reboot of Star Trek, and uh, so I'm looking forward to to seeing the new movie. Yeah, here's a here's a, a a secret for you guys. At NASA, sometimes we have to go to meetings. Sometimes uh, we ha we we end up in places and hearing things we don't want to. We'd rather be doing something else. And uh, and when we do, we kind of sometimes get that you know uh, 240 mile look in our eyes, and say, "Wow, uh, I wish I were up in space, and I wish I were up in space right now." Uh, but you know, it, and then you think about some of the recent Star Trek episodes you watched, and you start to say, "Yeah." That's inspirational. That's why I'm here at NASA because of that vision that you guys share with us. Now we don't have as much as excitement. You know, we don't jump off of uh, fifty thousand uh, foot cliffs and things like that. But uh, when we do have our excitement, like on spacewalks, it's because you know we we we, we stuck with it and that we uh, were were inspired when we needed to be. Thank you. Uh, I get, although I'll respond to that by saying you cannot imagine how stupid we feel talking <laughs> to you. <laughs> uh, we we uh, we've got a question uh, from Twitter uh, at Lisa Fuller McGee four H asks uh, were any devices at NASA specifically developed because of of Star Trek because someone liked to watch Star Trek is there uh, d did the show uh, obviously has been around since the uh, since the late sixties um, have you heard that it had any direct influence on on development of NASA tech. Well, of course, uh, everyone knows that uh, you know there were, for a while there there was these flip telephones that coincidentally looked like uh, the original series uh, communicators. Uh, but here at NASA, uh, a lot of things uh, what you know what you guys imagine how small to make something, how cool we can make it. We we try to imi imitate it. Uh, we don't have phasers, uh, but we do have things like uh, as Chell was talking about with the with the with the tricorders. All right, so we don't have a tricorder that can get everything yet. But we're we're working on it so that we can get some you know little data package that can tell us how someone's doing. Uh, we have an experiment up on station right now called Microflow, which uh, instead of uh, using really big tubes of of, uh, of liquids to get an analysis, a chemical analysis, it uses these really tiny uh, little uh, disposable cartridges and chips. And that same technology finds its way into the hospital room just a few years after we you know experiment with it at NASA, and it's uh, it's pretty neat. We're working towards a tricorder and warp drive. Hmm. Uh, which one of you is a doctor? That's you. Have you have you uh, have you ever found occasion to say, "Damn it, man! Uh, I'm, a, uh, I'm a doctor, not a, not a blank." <laughs> Every opportunity that I have, that I can uh, I can say that I try to say that, and it's uh, <laughs> very I'm not you, a physicist. I'm not an engineer. Yeah, so. if you can work it in some way in the next 24 hours, Paramount will pay you 100 American dollars. Uh, I, I think awesome. I, you, are you guys good for that? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Absolutely. Two hundred dollars. Uh, I, I, uh, now, uh, my understanding is that we also have some questions at the Intrepid. Is that correct? Are, is, yes. Are, are you guys standing by? We would love to hear. Hi, Hi guys. Hi, Intrepid. Hey, wow, Intrepid. you look so, you look so, uh, so poised. Uh, please, like a school portrait. Ask away. <laughs> okay. Um, my name is Nadine Cavanaugh. I'm a journal. Uh, I'm a journalist. I'm a junior at World Journalism Preparatory School, and my question is for Mike Fink. In the film and television series Star Trek, 
The crew assigned at the Enterprise come from a variety of backgrounds and in some cases, species. The ISS is run by a group of varied social, educational, and cultural backgrounds as well. They are very diverse. What are the advantages and disadvantages of having di a diverse crew and team on board the ISS? What a great question. And uh, it's not coincidental either. Uh, it's uh, by having a diverse crew like we do aboard the space station, which is not uh, coincidental with how Star Trek did it and Gene Broddenberry's original vision. But uh, we have the diverse crews that we have. Everyone brings their talents and their skills. And uh, not even Captain Kirk has uh, all the skills. He needs a Spock to balance them out and a Bones in there too. And the same thing aboard the space station. We have Americans, Russians, Canadians, Japanese. Uh, we, we have people that are, are Navy SEALs or like Chell here, a doctor, or myself, and you know, an, an Air Force flight test engineer. And we all bring out the best in each other. And uh, that's what really happens. That's why we get the mission done because we are diverse. I have a five-year-old daughter, and uh, she stunned me one day when she told me when she was three years old that girls can't be astronauts. So every day, every time I get a chance, I say, hey, look, girls can be astronauts, boys can be astronauts, black, white, yellow, tan, whatever color you want to be, whatever species <laughs> you are. Because I was accused of being an alien earlier. serve <laughs> up in space, and we need you. We need your talents. Absolutely. You hate her. Yeah. Awesome. I, Thank uh, you. It was a compliment. <laughs> it was definitely a compliment. I think uh, John's gonna uh, got another social media question for you, uh, gentlemen. Uh, by the way, thank you for that answer, especially I, that was something that I, that was very important to me watching the original series as well, and thank you guys for uh, focusing on diversity. Um, I got a, uh, a question from Twitter user uh, at Samantha Rye. I'm sorry, that's not the... No, at Stevansky9814. Each astronaut can bring a personal item weighing one kilogram to space. What would you bring with you? I'll start off. Uh, yeah, we get to bring up a little thing. So I, I, I bring up pictures of my, my family. Um, I wish I could bring up, a, you know, a, 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 I don't know, a tricorder or something like that or something something useful a uh, universal translator sometimes uh, Russian's a tough language uh, those kind of things but uh, uh, you, you bring up something that's meaningful to you I brought up my wedding ring and uh, memories of my family uh, that helped keep me going Jill yeah, that's, a, that's yeah. a great question and that's something that I'm actually wrestling with right now I, I will uh, launch in about two years from now uh, May 2015 and uh, so I'm actually at this moment, trying to figure out what it is that uh, that I'd like to bring with me. I don't, I don't have an answer yet. So, how about a headshot of me? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's it feels like it's very lightweight. Yeah, it's lightweight. I mean, you, John, I'm not saying don't bring up other stuff. I'm a John show doll. You could bring several and, and hand them out. Uh, do you do, do you want to ask doll. one of these? Yeah, a doll. All right, yeah, you got it, buddy. Like, yeah. All right. The hair is too big. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is this is actually the question that John abandoned from um, at Samantha Rye. In the films, there has always been some sort of gravitational force aboard the ships. Um, how close is NASA to making this a reality? Why would we? Uh, you saw how fun it is to fly, um, and uh, and Chris. Uh, Chris uh, up on board station, he, uh, he, he actually was holding back on you guys because he, he could have flown back and forth the whole time. And none of it is CGI. None of it's computer graphics. <laughs> so it's really fun. So flying. you say. So you say. <laughs> so I know. It's so true. You never get tired. After a whole year, I never got tired of flying. It was really, really fun. So that's one reason why we don't uh, do gravity. Uh, it would be great for us if we could. If we could master the force of gravity, that could help us uh, learn better propulsion systems, make uh, you know, some really good energy systems here on, on planet Earth so we don't pay so much for oil, those kind of things. All that kind of cool technology is something that you, know, you guys are helping inspire the, to, to get some really smart people to figure out how, how we can do that. And once we do that, then we can go do some real exploration. Well, can I ask, does, is NASA active in recruiting people? I mean, physicians, scientists, are they, do they go out and look for people, or is it mostly incoming where you guys uh, 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 want to be part of the program and, and, and ask? Well, that's a, that's a great question, and NASA is actively out recruiting. I mean, we really want the best uh, minds, um, and uh, we want inquisitive minds to, uh, <laughs> <laughs> to, 
to, yeah. to come and work with us, to, to help us to explore. And so we're definitely out in universities. Um, we actually have a, a group that does a destination station and goes out and talks with universities, talks with businesses uh, to actively recruit to come, people to come work at NASA. That's, I think, what makes NASA um, so strong is just the, the quality of people that we have uh, working here. And, and to turn that back to you, though, I mean, I think... Uh, you know, I was inspired by by science fiction, by the written word, by film when I was little, and that's what really made me pursue uh, a career in science. Um, inspired me to to uh, try and, and reach this goal. Um, I have a question for: Do you guys ever feel the weight of uh, being a role model, or of, or what you were doing to inspire folks to uh, to get involved in science? I don't know. I, I think it's uh, what's so wonderful about talking with you is is how the arts and science uh, have a where they meet somewhere in the middle. I always thought growing up, I wasn't ever scientifically minded as much as I would have loved to have had a brain for for math and technology. But it's it's great that that our worlds can meet at some point in the middle and hopefully uh, inspire people to do. Um, to do good things and to explore and to uh, and the great thing about the vision of, of, of Gene Roddenberry is that there's this kind of um, hopefulness to what people can do when they work together and uh, that spirit of unity and and uh, instead of what we often see in the world you know divisiveness and violence and all that I think is a, a great thing it's been really inspiring talking to you yeah. I, I, I do have a question for you guys, which is, uh, uh, obviously, here we are now in the year 2013. If, if you were to just uh, close your eyes and imagine what is the future of, of, of the space program or, or just mankind's uh, sort of experience with uh, the, the world around us and the world beyond, where do you think we're going to be in 20 years that we aren't now? Well... I think one of the things, um, you know, personally, I would love to see us to, to go on to Mars. I think that's been a target uh, um, for humanity for a long time, to see this beautiful red planet. Uh, you know, you can see it in the sky, see it through a telescope, and now beautiful pictures coming from uh, Curiosity and all of the rovers that we've had out there. Um, but more importantly, I think that projects like that and projects like the International Space Station, um, what an amazing thing to bring countries together from all over the world to work on a piece uh, a peaceful project that's dedicated to, to science, to investigation, to research, to making life better on the earth and not individually working against each other. I mean, we have a team of nations now that uh, were mortal en enemies, uh, you know, 40, 50, 60 years ago, and now we're working together uh, to a common goal. And so continued work like that, I think, is the most important thing. Um, but to, to work together to a project, to get to Mars, to get to, to another planet, um, and maybe for a, a peaceful, or I'm sorry, for a permanent stay there, um, that would be an incredible thing. Did you guys always want to be astronauts? And, and secondly, what are those qualities that you, you believe are the, the kind of the important qualities that an astronaut uh, needs to exhibit? Well, for myself, uh, I have, as, for as long as I can remember, always wanted to be, become an astronaut. It's not something that, that I necessarily ever thought would uh, would. It seems like a, an, an out-of-this-world type of a, a possibility, mm -hmm. but, uh, but it's something that uh, I've always, I always kept, kind of kept as a, as a very distant goal. Um, I always pursued things that uh, I was interested in doing, specifically medicine, and, uh, and then I was investigating ways, how, hey, how can I practice medicine uh, with the space program? And so I, I was able to get a job working at, here as a, as a flight surgeon. Um, taking care of the astronauts and and uh, you know things worked out and I have this tremendous blessing now of of working for NASA as an astronaut and being a part of this incredible team here um, and and for me you know I tried to think back to what was it that inspired me to do this and and I always really kind of come back to uh, the the worlds that were created uh, in and on film and in books uh, with science fiction Wow. Uh, you know, ever since I was three years old, I wanted to be a, a director and writer, but I failed the director writer school, and uh, then I tried acting, and that didn't work out. So now I go on spacewalks. <laughs> <laughs> where, 
we're all we're there's, all feeling a little for it, covetous. Too. Yeah, yeah. Are there any ex actors that do that? Yeah. I, I totally want to. Are there do any this. actors in space? Is yeah. the question. You guys need entertainment up there, for God's sake. Yeah. Come on. Well, I'll um, tell you what. Chris Hadfield just did, just did a tremendous job. Um, I think harnessing uh, the the visuals of space um, and uh, and Tom Marshburn as well uh, in uh, in producing some of the. Uh, the songs and, and visuals that uh, we've seen on YouTube lately. And so getting, being able to share that experience is, uh, is uh, tremendous. Now you talked about Mars and obviously uh, that, that, that could be years uh, down the road, but if it was in the next couple of years, would you, would you sign up for that mission? Uh, I would. E even, even if you were gone, uh, obviously in, in Star Trek, uh, there's a, uh, Simon Pegg goes to Jupiter. It takes about a, a minute, two yeah. minutes. <laughs> um, it, it would be a much more long, uh, long and involved journey. But would would you go for it? Would you do it? That's a that's a tough question. Um, <laughs> I would, right now, I would right away. <laughs> yeah. um, I think one of the it's, this is such an amazing job, and uh, the opportunity to go to the space station to do uh, research and science. Um, is an amazing thing. I think one of the toughest parts of this job is uh, being away from family, and that oh. is uh, our our training. I'm currently in the training flow um, for my mission. It's two and a half years, and about half that time is spent overseas, training with the Russians, with the Japanese, with the the Europeans. Um, we develop ways to to make that work, uh, FaceTime and Skype, and and all of those sort, sorts of uh, things. Um, and we have great ways to communicate while we're up on the space station. It would be hard to to be away from the family for um, as long as it would take to get to Mars, but uh, boy, what an amazing opportunity, and I think I would throw my hat in that ring. Uh, one, one more question. Uh, this is from the, actually the Star Trek, uh, the Star Trek app is, uh, is um, <coughs> accepting questions. Kirsten asks, uh, if you had your own starship, what would you name it? Don't think too hard. My, for me, I would name it the, uh, the USS Endurance. Um, nice. uh, Shackleton's uh, expedition to uh, to the Antarctic. I don't know if you've read about that. It's an amazing uh, story of uh, these guys getting shipwrecked and spending essentially uh, over a year, almost two years, um, surviving that that uh, that ordeal. I think it's really is that the Ken Branham one, Shackleton? There, there's I think there's a movie about that because we don't there... we don't actually study history. We just watch <laughs> each other's movies. <laughs> um, so it's like, oh yeah, Ken Branagh. That's right, he did that. Um, it's an amazing okay. story. You should yeah. watch the movie or read the book because it's uh, it's pretty incredible. Mm, excellent. And what about you? Uh, I name uh, it the Enterprise. Mike. I'm not very creative. <laughs> the Enterprise. Neither are we. I mean, look, we're, we're, we're <laughs> I, you know, we this this has been around for 40 years, and we're, uh, that's the best we can come up with. I went with victory when I was asked. Oh, that's victory. good. Yeah, that's very nice. I don't know victorious over what, but. Maybe we made it to Mars on the victory. Um, uh, I, I think that we have uh, time for actually just one final last question, which is my understanding is that one of you gentlemen uh, appeared as the Grand Marshal at Trek Fest uh -oh. uh, a year ago. Uh oh! What, did, did you have to? <laughs> shell, did you? What is, is that? Out. What is that involved? Is, is is there a sash? Do you have to speak Klingon? <laughs> what, 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 what outfit? What, Come what on! What does the Grand Marshal entail? Please share. I don't think there are any pictures out there. Uh, <laughs> Oh, God, I, I had the if there are, send them immediately. <laughs> <laughs> to go to Riverside, Iowa, the uh, the proposed birthplace yeah, of uh, Kirk, yeah. uh, in the not too distant future, um, and I think also the uh, where they build starships um, in the in the first movie. Um, I, I got to be in a parade and uh, and talk with a bunch of folks out there, um, and it was a it's a really neat opportunity. They had they're great folks out there, very excited about the. Uh, the Star Trek universe, and uh, and and it was inspiring to to talk with them. And 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 was it you, Chell, who actually appeared on the the television program Enterprise in the finale? Oh, that was you. Yeah. Well, uh, no, uh, and so you were on the show Enterprise. No wonder you pick Archer as your as your favorite captain. You've actually had the Bacula experience, as we call it. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. He was Baculized. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Count Bacula, as we. Um, uh, well, guys, uh, I, I just have to say, genuinely, um, uh, I, I, I speak for all of us. The, these guys are absolutely exhausted. But when we got word earlier this week that you were available to talk to us, 
uh, we were all uh, energized, if I can uh, use a pun. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your time. We aspire uh, to what you do in real life. Uh, I in plan on doing it. I'm going to quit. I want to come to you, Mars. Yeah. You want to come to the Mars? <laughs> I want to come to the Mars. <laughs> thank you for your service. Thank yeah, you, guys. We really yes, appreciate it. You, so uh, you have the coolest job in the world. Live long and prosper. <laughs> oh wow! Yeah, <laughs> careful! <laughs> Don't hurt yourself. We uh, we really appreciate uh, how you guys really inspire the planet. Uh, what you guys show about the humanity at its finest. Uh, we we fall for it every time here at NASA, and uh, and uh, big thanks to uh, the other teams out there at the Intrepid and the Smithsonian and everyone else out there in the Google Plus uh, universe. Uh, uh, we we are uh, really touched that uh, we had this great conversation today and uh, mutual admiration society because we really uh, think what you guys is great. Good luck on, on, on your on your film. Hope you break uh, one billion on opening night. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Smith, Dreams big. Dreams big. <laughs> Dreams big. Yeah. Smithsonian. <laughs> Smithsonian, are you still there? Can we get your best Vulcan salute? Oh, uh, Intrepid. Vulcan salute. Come on, guys. You can do there it. You go. Let's see. Ah, there we go. Oh, there we go. Yes, there we go. <laughs> You should have been practicing, guys. All right, thank you so much uh, you. for everybody who uh, who tuned in on, on behalf of us silly filmmakers. Uh, please go see our movie. We, we, we are really proud of it, but more importantly, support uh, NASA uh, and space exploration. It's really just an incredible uh, thing when you just wrap your brain around what just happened here today. And <laughs> we really like to thank our, our hosts, uh, uh, Google, for, for making this happen, and of course, NASA for enabling us and giving us that incredible uh, rare window of opportunity to talk to the ISS. Peace and love, guys. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Really appreciate you joining us. If anyone wants to learn more about the International Space Station, visit us, visit us on the web at www.nasa.gov station. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. This was a really fun event. Thanks.